Well, this morning we're going to be looking at this new man and, and talking about speech. You know, the new man has new speech. Uh, and you wouldn't think that what I'm going to present here heavily has to do with speech, but it does. So we're going to be looking at Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Last week we, we really covered prayer. Uh, the, the, you know how we should just really come to God in prayer. We need to have a better prayer life. We've got to have a, a, a dedicated time for prayer. Uh, and not just what I was saying last week, not just throw up flare prayers. Because a lot of times we throw up flare prayer. You know what a flare prayer is? It's we only call out to God when we want Him or when we need Him, not when we want Him. That's what I meant to say. Uh, we only call out to Him when, we need, when we're in need. And then once our troubles and everything are past, guess what? We go right back to the old lifestyle. And we got to be careful not to do that. God wants us even beforehand. And I was sharing with you that if we, if we aren't serious about God in our walk when we don't need Him, take that in the way that I mean that. <laughs> we need Him all the time. But I'm talking about in our moments of trouble, right? Um, if we aren't committed to Him all the time, when we get in our trouble and need, we might cry out to God and we may not hear. We saw that last week, right? He wants us to be serious about Him all the time, needing Him all the time, bowing down to Him all the time, surrendering our life to Him completely all the time, and totally committed. Um, it's not easy sometimes to do, especially when you um, don't have loved ones that are dedicated to Him. Maybe you got your, in your situation that, you know, it's just really hard sometimes because you're surrounded by people who aren't believers, right? But we need to stay committed to Him regardless. Is even though it, it might get hard. But today we're going to just look at uh, uh, speaking truth. I, I think that one of the hardest things to do, because speaking truth, believe it or not, has consequences. And we're going to see that, what happens about speaking truth, right? A lot of times people don't want to speak the truth. It's because there are consequences to that. Uh, we can see it in Paul's life. We can see it in all the apostles' lives. Speaking the truth, where did that get them? Where did they end up, Right? And so speaking the truth sometimes is hard and difficult because we are afraid of what people are going to think, what people are going to say, what they're going to do. But our Lord told us, don't fear of those who can kill the body, but fear the one who can kill the body and the soul. All right? So we need to be committed to Him 100% of the time, all the time, and not just in a time of despair and in a time of need, but we should want Him and know that we need Him continually all the time. And we're going to see that here briefly. Let's look at our passage of Scripture in, in Colossians chapter 4, verses uh, 2 through 6, and then um, I'll back up because it, I'm going to have to put this into two parts because it's just, there's so much information I want to pack in here. I just want to make sure we don't leave anything out, okay? So let's pray and we'll re read the word. Lord, I pray, God, as we read your word this morning, that you would impress upon our minds and our hearts how to serve you, how to be uh, in love with you, how to commit our life to you, Lord Jesus. And I pray, God, we wouldn't just be <clears throat> Sunday morning servants of yours. We would be 100% every single day, every single hour, every single minute a servant of yours and committed to you. And I pray, Lord Jesus, as we hear your word this morning, that we'd be encouraged, challenged, Maybe convicted in our heart, Lord, of what we need to do to live a life that's totally 100% committed to you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so in verse 2 it says, so they uh, continue earnestly in what? Prayer. We looked at prayer. They were doing it earnestly. You have to seek it earnestly and vigilantly. You have to be vigilant in your prayer life. And that's what it says. Being vigilant in it with what? Thanksgiving. Meanwhile, pray also for us so that... God would open, up, open to us doors for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom. Okay, that's a good one. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time while we still are alive, while we still have time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each other. So we're supposed to be seasoned with salt, we're supposed to be speaking the truth, and we're supposed to be the light in a dark world. Which means we've got to be fully committed in everything that we do. And we have trouble speaking this truth because of family members, because of, uh, you know, we, we don't want to offend anybody. 
Well, I don't think Jesus was too afraid to speak the truth. I don't think the apostles were too afraid to speak the truth, no matter who it offended. Jesus spoke so much that actually he almost preached people away from him. Oh, that's too hard of a saying, Jesus. How do we do that? Look at the rich man came to Jesus. How must I be saved? He says, keep the commandments. He starts reading them off. He says, I've done all that. Okay, go back and sell everything you have. Give away to the poor. Then come and follow me. And the rich man couldn't do it. He couldn't commit his life to Jesus Christ 100%. And who made that decision, Christ or the rich man? The rich man. And see, we all make that choice. We either follow God or we don't. But the world, as I said, I think last week or week before, you cannot have your sin and salvation. You can't have both. You will serve one and hate the other or serve the other and hate the other. You can't serve both at the same time. But that's what the world wants. They, the world wants their sin and their salvation. And so uh, there was a pastor friend that down in Florida. He had just gotten off a phone call. This was just last week. He'd just gotten off a phone call. Um, he'd just gotten off a phone call and because uh, the, they were looking for a new church. His mother was looking for a new church for her and her daughter because the daughter had come out and decided that she was gay. And he tried to convince him, well, well don't just go to a, a church that's inclusive, but go to a church that's, truth speak, that's a truth-speaking church. That doesn't mean you hate, doesn't mean you don't love them, it, it means you speak the truth. And I told you that story that one time, that, that uh, uh, I was talking to this person, or I was preaching that uh, Sunday morning, this was years ago, this is probably 18, 19 years ago, and I was preaching, and... and uh, I just said something about this lifestyle, and this, there we had some people, uh, two gals that were uh, living that, that lifestyle, and they got really, really mad at me, because I, I told, you know, what the, what the Scripture says about, you know, the gay, and, and the gay lifestyle, what, what, what Scripture says about it. Just speak the truth. Don't be afraid of the truth, but do it in love. Do it in compassion. That doesn't mean you, you hate and love, uh, or that you don't love and that you hate. It just means that, look, I want you to be saved. And this is, what it, this is what we have to do to be saved. This is what it means to be a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice means we don't do the things that we have a tendency to or desire to do. It means a living sacrifice means we take our desires of the flesh and we put them over there and we keep them over there and we follow Jesus Christ. You don't follow the desires of the heart. You don't follow the desires of the flesh. It's a living sacrifice. It means, yes, I have these natural tendencies. And and it doesn't have to be just a a gay lifestyle. It could be drugs. It could be alcohol. It could be pornography. It could be whatever. You have a natural tendency or or to, to, to gravitate towards something. To be committed to Christ means, and to be a living sacrifice means I'm putting those things over there and I'm getting rid of those things because it's not pleasing to God. I want to be pleasing to God. And you're going to have to fight those temptations. You're going to have to fight those desires every single day of your life. It means you get up every single day and you pray every single day, God, thank you for another day. God, make this a life, and this is in prayer, vigilantly seeking him and giving thanksgiving. Thank you for the life that you've given me today, Lord Jesus. Help me to be successful. Then if you have a bad day and you, and you gravitate back to the, the old way of life, there should be a, 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 a conviction and a, and a remorse in your heart and you should want to come back and still lay that off. You're fighting it. You gravitate toward it, but you should always want to turn and face toward God. Be like David. Look at all the things David did. (laughs) And yet God used him. Why? Because David had a heart after God. That's how we're supposed to live our life. A heart that is fervently searching, seeking, wanting, desiring God in our life and everything that we do. That's the way we're supposed to live. And so Paul... He was this way, truly, he loved the gospel. And so when he gave his life to Christ, or in Christ, he had that Damascus, you know, the road to Damascus, he had that experience with God, and Jesus, Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, who are you, Lord? He goes, I am, I am Jesus, the one whom you're persecuting. What was he doing? He was going to go round up all the Christians, wasn't he? But he had a total change of heart because of his experience with Jesus Christ. And that's the way it is with you and me. We have this new experience. We have this new way of life. We have this new way of thinking. We have this new heart. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. And we turn away from the old way of life and we go to the new way of life. Paul says, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He says, I was a sinner of sinners. If anybody, it would have been me. 
And yet, look what, look what Paul gave. He gave all that up. Why? Because he realized who Jesus Christ was. And so, the rest of his life, he would live out the gospel message. And it wouldn't be easy. It would be very difficult. Very, very difficult. But it was compelled him to speak the truth. And this is what, what, what I feel many times. I'm sitting there thinking, why is so-and-so over there when they should be over here? Why can't so-and-so listen and hear what, what, we, what we try to say? Why can't the people that I've prayed for and loved so much, why can't they see the truth of the gospel? Why do they reject it? Why do they live in sin? Why do they hate me so much because of the message of salvation that I bring through Jesus Christ? I want you to live, not die. I want you to know the truth. Because the Bible says the truth, you shall know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. What does it set you free from? From the bondage of sin, from the desires of the old way of life, from the things that are holding you in bondage, for the things that are making you so miserable in life, for the things that you're holding on to, for all the things that, that uh, keep you captive, for all the miserable um, mistakes that you've made. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that set you free from the bondage of the sin in your life and it sets you free to serve him amen that's what it does it sets us free from being a captive because you're going to be in bondage to something you're either in bondage to sin and you're in bondage to your way of life you're in bondage to your own heart you've rejected christ or you set those things aside and now you're in bondage to christ and that is freedom it's freedom it is I can't explain it. I can't give it to you. And I want people to know. And I understand. Because in the, in the life of ministry, I've had many people yell and scream at me. I've had people leave the church mad because I would not deviate from the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will not deviate from His Word. It says what it says. And we either live it or we don't. We either believe it or we don't. We are either committed to it or we're not. You see, we have to be fully committed to the gospel, vigilantly seeking it in prayer and thanksgiving, giving everything we have to Jesus and to God for what he has done for us. And that's what compels me. And that's what the, the, that's what the, the, the passion inside of me comes out because I want people to know the truth. We have family members that we are so we love so much and they want nothing to do with us because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I'm not deviating from it. Our oldest daughter, I don't know if I was going to say this, especially on live feed, but I will because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It has nothing to do with us. Because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, there's a lot of other excuses as to why. And so we're denied even seeing our grandkids. Don't think it's not hard. Because it is. We love her dearly. We raised her. She's, she's our child. But we love her. And we want her to know the gospel but, man, well, I bring it up. <laughs> I remember one time I was in a room full of people. This was a family event. I remember one time um, somebody said, well, you know, I got the Koran at home, and I'm reading the Koran, and I don't see anything wrong with the Koran. That's Islam. Muslim, okay, that's Islam. I don't see anything wrong with it. It sounds like a peaceful um, religion to me. I go, okay, okay. I didn't say anything. I'm just sitting there. And, and what they were doing is they know who I was, who I am. They, knew, they know what I do. And I'm just sitting there listening to the conversation. I'm not even engaging. I'm just sitting here to listen and listen and listen, you know. And they're prodding at me. They're poking at me on purpose. That's what they were doing. And weren't you baptized in the, in, in the Mormon church? Or, you know, we were raised Mormon. You know, they were throwing everything out there on purpose. And I'm just sitting there, quiet, listening. Because you know what? I can't be the Holy Spirit for them, and I'm not going to react to that. The Bible says, don't argue with fools. Be the light. 
And then all of a sudden, it gets kind of quiet, and somebody in the room looks at me and goes, well, don't you know something about, the, about Islam? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> yep. They heard it. I don't think we've had another event like that since. Not one we've been invited to anyway. I didn't. You bet. Set me free from them, I guess. I don't know. See, the truth has consequences for those who tell it. But I'm not afraid of man, the consequences I get from the world. I'm not afraid of the consequences I get from people. Lord forbid that I ever deny him before my fellow man. Because he says, if you deny me before man, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. That's what Jesus said. It's what compelled Paul to preach. It's what compels me to get up here every Sunday. It's what compels me to keep going forward, even when I got people mad at me and don't want to see me. We want our daughter so bad to know how much we love her and how our hearts are empty without her in our life. She's a good person, funny, loving. But when it comes to the gospel, mm -mm. and so Paul, in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, says, Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. That's how I feel. Woe to me if I don't tell people the truth. Woe to me if I don't tell people how to live their life. No matter how much the truth hurts and no matter what it exposes in somebody's life, in somebody's life no matter how they're going to label me or hate me, listen, I'm trying to tell you in compassion and love, I don't want you to die apart from God. That's, that's the truth. That's what I, I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. Don't die apart from Jesus Christ. This is the only testing ground we have. The Living Bible, in that same verse, says it this way. I kind of like this version. It says, For just preaching the gospel isn't uh, any special credit to me. That's Paul. I couldn't keep from preaching it, eh, preaching it if I wanted to. I would be utterly miserable. What to me if I don't? That Jesus gets into Paul's life. He can't help but preach. He wants to live by it. He wants to love it. He wants it in his life more than anything else. And he wants to compel people to live for the gospel, to give their life to Jesus Christ. We should be compelled to do the same thing. We should have the same desire to serve God. We should be compelled to tell people and bring them into the light out of the darkness. That's what we ought to be doing. The gospel is truth. It is the saving truth. It is the word of truth. It is alive and breathing and everything. It, it, it changes lives. It changes lives. John 1.14 says, And Christ became human being and lived here on earth among us and was full of love, loving forgiveness and truth. What was he full of? Forgiveness. There's nothing in your life that God will not forgive if you will come before Him and truly seek Him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He will forgive you of your past. That is a loving God. And people go, why isn't God loving? It's because you're not loving Him. Why is all this stuff happening in, your life, in my life? Because you're not following after the truth. You're following after your own desires in life. But if you will come to God, and if you will surrender your life to God, guess what? He will forgive you of your sins. And He's full of truth. And it goes on. And some of us have seen His glory, the glory of the only Son and the Heavenly Father. John 8, 31-32 says, So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed Him, If you continue in My Word, then you are truly disciples of Mine. What does He mean? What does He say? You have to continually live it. You have to continually live it out in your life. And it says that you will know the truth, and what? The truth will you know it, set you free. John 14, 6, and Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. It was really interesting because when I was preaching on prayer last week, we have some people that actually watch our live stream, I think one. Um, hi, Harold, by the way, if he's watching right now. 
um, he, he texts me, you know, um, and uh, he goes, you didn't take, when you were talking about prayer, you didn't say anything about Jesus praying through Jesus' name. I go, Jesus is the only way to pray. I can't save myself. I can't save you. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so when we come to, the Jesus, to Jesus, we pray through Jesus to the Father in his name. Why? Because we can't save ourselves. We're nothing but this d- d- deceitful, lying, cheaters, adulterous people, aren't we? It's only through Jesus Christ that we are purified. It's through him and him alone. So when we pray and we come to him, we say, Jesus' name. In him, we are made pure. In him alone. And then John 18, 37 says, As Therefore, Pilate said to him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world. What? To testify of what? The truth. You know what the world will say? Actually, what I would say to the world Truth? You can't handle the truth. Have you ever seen that movie? <laughs> right? The world can't handle the truth. So what do they do? They do everything they can to cover it up. They'll write laws against preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they could come in here right now and say, I cannot preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then take me away in handcuffs because I will not pro- ever quit proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation for anybody who will believe. And so when Paul was in, in, in prison, and by the way, you know, this is a prison letter in Colossians that we just read. So it's Philippians, Philemon, and Ephesians. These were prison letters. These were letters written by Paul when he was in chains and in captive, or, 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 or a captive. But he didn't get depressed. I'm sure he had bad days. We know he has. If you just read some of the letters of Paul. But you know what? He always approached it as an opportunity to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every time. It doesn't matter if he's in chains or not. He was going to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. So there's truth, or speaking the truth, does have its consequences. But who are you going to fear? What mere man can do to us? Or denying God before man? The gospel is truth. It is never-ending truth. It is all truth. It leads to all truth. It is eternal, and it, it, it leads us to a home that never ends. So Paul was a man convicted, had a conviction into action, and he is compelled to speak the truth. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, Perhaps Apostle Paul was the greatest man that ever lived as an apostle. He said this, quote, He was uh, always great at everything. If you considered him a a sinner, he was the greatest sinner that ever lived. If you regarded him as a persecutor, he was the greatest persecutor of the church that has ever been known to persecuting the Christians from city to city. If you look at him as a convert, his conversion was the most notable one that that has ever been read. Charles Spurgeon. A true converted heart is compelled to live in the truth of God through Jesus Christ. A true believer is a lover of truth no matter what. A true believer is committed to the truth no matter the consequences that arrive from it or are derived from it. So I want you to just, just know that Paul knew this as he was writing this letter in prison. You see, Paul wasn't doing things in the old traditional way, was he? He was converted now. He wasn't stuck in the legalistic things of life. He was free to preach the gospel, so he wasn't doing things. He was taking the message. You're taking it to the Gentiles, those people over there? Yes, he was. And because he was going against the tradition of the rules and the implications of the rules, they hated him for it, and he became persecuted for it. Turn over to Acts real quick. Acts 21, briefly. Go to Acts 21, verse 26. Listen. Now remember, Paul was a Pharisee. He's a Pharisee. He was a Jewish. He was was trained by Gamaliel. He was was, was, steeped in it. 
And when he was persecuting the, the, the Christians, he was doing it out of fervent desire to serve God. So now Paul gets converted, takes to the temple, goes to the temple. What do they want to do? They want to kill him for it. Listen to, the, listen to this. Then Paul took the men. This is in um, uh, Acts 21, 21, 26. Okay? Then Paul took the men, and the next day, having been purified with them, so he went through the traditional stuff with them, okay? Entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. Now, I'm not going to get into all the traditionals here, traditions here, but I want, I want you to see what happened to Paul, okay? Now, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he also brought the Greeks into the temple, which, by the way, was a lie. They were setting Paul up, okay? He brought a Greek into the temple um, and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen um, uh, Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed Paul had brought into the temple, which they wouldn't have done. So they made this accusation. Wow, isn't that what we do today? We did, all we got to do against somebody is make an accusation becomes truth. Right? That's all you do. You can make all the actions. You know, slander and, and uh, telling lies and falsehoods against somebody else used to be against the law. You can do it all. all you know, all you got to do now is make an accusation. This is exactly what they did to Paul. They brought a Greek into the temple. It didn't happen. They lied to set him up. But Paul was so committed to this, listen to this. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now, as they were seeking to what? Kill him. News came to the commander of the garrison of all the Jerusalem, of all Jerusalem, well, that all of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw, uh, saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. They were going to kill Paul for preaching the truth in the temple. Then the commander came near, took him, and commanded him to be bound with two chains. He, the commander was really saving Paul's life here. Okay, And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. They said, he did this, he did that. They were just making things up now. Right? It goes on, so, so when he could not ascertain the truth, hmm, <laughs> think about our world. How do you ascertain the truth? anymore. I don't know. Pretty hard to do. But they couldn't get the truth, okay, uh, because of the tumult. He commanded him to be taken into the barracks. When he reached the stairs, listen to what Paul does. Now, just remember what just happened. Remember how they were beating him. They took him out of the temple. They closed the door. And now he's shackled in chains with the centurion. They're going to take him away. And listen to what Paul does. When he reached the stairs, he had, uh, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed uh, after crying out, away with him. Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I speak to you? And he replied, can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the uh, 4,000 assassins uh, out into the wilderness. Don't have time to get into that, but listen to what Paul did. But Paul said, I am a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of... Now, he's giving his credentials here, okay? And I wish I had time to get into this, but I don't. But anyway, he's giving his credentials here. A uh, citizen of no mean city, and I implore you... Now listen, permit me to speak to the people. Speak to the people that just tried to kill you? Speak to the people that were just in such an uproar that didn't want you around? Let me speak to the people. 
He says, so when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hands to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language. Go read verse or chapter 22 and you can get the rest of the story. Okay? And he goes into this whole long thing of who he was and what he did and the conversion. And he talks, starts, starts telling the people, look, I'm telling you, all your legalism, all your rituals, all the things that you were keeping, all the circumcisions, all the Sabbaths, all the, the laws that you were keeping are meaningless, are no longer required. All you need is Jesus Christ for your salvation. And if you will turn to him, you'll be forgiven of your sins. You will receive the Holy Spirit. And guess what? You will be saved. That's his message. That's our message to the world. And when we speak truth, this is our message. We speak truth to the world so that why? They can be saved. And guess what the world's response is going to be? The same response that Paul got in the temple. The same response. So don't be surprised when the world is hostile toward the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Speak the truth anyway. Stand in it. Love it, know it, draw near to it, desire it above all things, regardless of what the world is about to do. And so there's a couple things. I'm going to speed through uh, some of this stuff here. The speech of the new man then. We have this new speech, right? Um, out of the heart. You know, Jesus was saying it isn't the, uh, you know, he would... They were accusing Jesus of not keeping the, the rituals, the washing of the hands. Why? And so he's challenged, why are they not keeping the rituals, the washing of the hands? He goes, listen, this is not what goes into the body that defiles a man, but it goes into the stomach. It doesn't go into the heart. It passes the heart. It goes into the stomach, and it doesn't defile a man. What defiles a man? What defiles a person? It's what comes out of the mouth. And it isn't just out of the mouth. It's how we live our life. It's what defiles us. So we defile. We reject God. We go to the old. We, we, we live in this world. And we defile ourselves because we're not living in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So we're defiled. And we defile our own bodies. But what we do, what we say, how we act. The heart is wicked. Jeremiah 17, 9. Who can know it? And so it says in Matthew 15, 19, and 20, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies, all of it, adulterers, fornications, everything. These are, what, these are the things that defile a man, but, what, um, but to eat with unwashed hands, that doesn't defile a man. It's what's in here. If you know to do right and you don't do it, it's never got here. If you know to do right and you don't have remorse for doing wrong, it never got here. You never let it get from the brain to the heart. Because that's what we feel. That's what we know. That's how we, we know when we're, we're really convicted. So we defile our bodies in all different kinds of ways. We defile our bodies with sex and alcohol, pornography, drugs, alcohol, and it kills the body. It kills us as individuals. It kills us as it's being, you know, it just, it destroys us. Don't let it destroy your life. Let God set you free from all those things. Come to Him. Live your life toward Him. In Mark 7, 18 and 23, He says, So He said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him because it does not enter the heart, the goats, but... Um, but uh, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. And he said, what comes out of a man defiles a man. So it isn't just the lips, what we speak, it's how we live that comes out. And people will know if we're committed by how we live. People will know if we're serious by how you live. People will know if you're saved or not by how you live. People will know if you're saved or not by how you speak. People will know if you're saved by, by if, there, if there's no fruit in your life. People will know. And so Matthew, uh, so it's Matthew, I had this in here twice. 15, okay. Um, 
So we know that it's what defiles us. In fact, even Isaiah was saying, you know, whoa, 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 is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a man of unclean lips. And that's what he says in Isaiah 6, 5. So he said, woe to me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. Sin, defilement. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And what he's saying here, woe is me. I'm in the presence of God. And I, have, I am living a defiled life. Woe is me. See, we should have a reverential fear toward God that when we violate his commands, when we violate his word, we should have true remorse in our heart. And we say, woe is me, Lord. God, forgive me, for I am unclean. And now we are forgiven through his son, Jesus Christ. I am a man of unclean lips. He realized, Isaiah here realized that he could never measure up to the power and the honor and the righteousness of God, and neither can you, and neither can I. None of us can measure up. It's only through His Son, Jesus Christ. Psalm 24, 4 and 5 says, He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, and that could be anything in your life, not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive what? Blessings from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. 2 Timothy 22, 22, here, here we go. Flee also the useful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. When you do that, you will be blessed. You will have a purpose for your life. And so we have these four, four uh, types of speech, and I'm going to get to two of them, because the next one I want to talk about next week is proclamation, our proclamation. And I want to really get into depth in that. So real briefly here, these first two types, speech of prayer. We talked about this, okay? It was a, a speech of prayer. I was going to take you to Daniel, but go read Daniel chapter 6. This is talking about the governors and the satraps, and, and uh, Daniel is set up. He's thrown into the lion's den. And, and, okay, go read that. What did Daniel do when he knew that this decree was going to come out? Because he says, let us for 30 days just say, um, nobody, anybody who lifts up, a different God other than Darius the king, uh, and he, then they trapped them. They were setting Daniel up, okay? And he goes, <clears throat> and uh, what did Daniel do? He knew this decree was going to come out. He goes to his room, and he prays three times and lifts his hand, uh, eyes toward heaven, and gives God. He didn't care. God, they can do anything with the body. They can throw me in the lion's den. They can take Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, throw them into a fiery furnace. But if you know God, nobody can touch you. Satan himself cannot touch you. Do not be afraid of those who can hurt the body. Okay? Don't be afraid of that. So we have the speech of prayer, and so this is what Daniel did. He lifts his, his voice to heaven. What's what Paul did when he was in chains? He lifts his voice toward heaven. That's what Peter did. He lifted his voice toward heaven, did, chained up in prison, and he's released, and they're going to go to get him, and they go, where'd he go? Do you believe God is a God of miracles? Do you believe God is, is a God that's still in the, uh, the, uh, the business of taking care of the ones that love him? Of course he is. Of course he is. So in Daniel 6.10, this is where it comes from. You can go read Daniel chapter 6. Then I'll just give you this. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, that was to go to get him, he went home. He, he went to his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed. What did he do? He gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since his early days. <laughs> He's thankful. <laughs> How can you be thankful? Because you know God has you covered. Be thankful. And so... Darius, he didn't, want to put, he didn't want to put Daniel in lion's den, did he? Oh, now I've got to because I signed this thing. And so you go down, if you jump down to verse 23 in Daniel chapter 6, it says, Then the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should uh, take Daniel up out of, the lion, out of the den. So Daniel was taken up. Now, I don't know all that happened to the lion's den that night, but I can almost, I can just see Daniel praying to God all night long. And he shut up the mouths of the lions. Darius goes down there. Is he still alive? Nobody could believe it. And there's Daniel. He didn't fear. We fear everything now. Okay, then there's that speech real briefly of Thanksgiving. 
Paul was in prison at the writing of this letter in Colossians. Yet he's thankful for his chains because he didn't see the suffering. He sees it as an opportunity to serve God. So we are to have a, a, a prayer of thanksgiving. Psalms, I'll end, with, I'll end with this. Psalm 69, 34 through 36 says, Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah, and they will dwell there and possess it. Also the descendants of his servants will inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. Amen. That is a promise. He's everything we need. Jesus. Right? You've got to come back next week because I'm going to tell you and we're going to talk about how to make, out of this passage of Scripture, Colossians 4, 6, 2, how to make a proclamation for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Live for Him. Lift Him up. Be thankful for all things. 